Hi guys, Slightly Sick Dane here with you today, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Hunger Games Catching Fire by Suzanne Collins. So this is the second book in the heart-stopping Hunger Games trilogy. I read and enjoyed the first book, which I will link to below, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to let you know what I thought of book number two. Does it have a blurb? It actually doesn't have a blurb. Okay, well, at the end, I don't want to say too much anyway. I don't want to say too much about this anyway in terms of the blurb because obviously it's the second book in a trilogy but you know I think most people know the general idea of the Hunger Games here so I thought this was interesting right at the beginning because this is the way it starts and throughout this series there's the phrase uh, may the odds be forever in your favor that's like a common motif so literally this is uh, chapter one part one and uh, the first paragraph I clasped the flask between my hands even though the warmth from the tea has long since leached into the frozen air. My muscles are clenched tight against the cold. If a pack of wild dogs were to appear at this moment, the odds of scaling a tree before they attacked are not in my favour. I just thought, thought that was a nice little tie back to that, you know, recurring line. So, um, what's her name? Katniss go, gets, uh, she's going to be on television again, it being used as like propaganda for the capital. And um, obviously she lives quite a hard life and so she doesn't spend too much time thinking about her personal appearance. And I think this is just an interesting little, uh, little paragraph here, I guess. If I feel ragged, my prep team seems in worse condition, knocking back coffee and sharing brightly coloured little pills. As far as I can tell, they never get up before noon unless there's some sort of national emergency, like my leg hair. I was so happy when it grew back in too, as if it were a sign that things might be returning to normal. I run my fingers along the soft, curly down on my legs and give myself over to the team. None of them are up to their usual chatter, so I can hear every strand being yanked from its follicle. I have to soak in a, thub I have to soak in a tub full of a thick, unpleasant-smelling solution, while my face and hair are plastered with creams. Two more baths follow in other, less offensive concoctions. I'm plucked and scoured and massaged and anointed until I'm raw. I suppose it's a bit like polishing a diamond in a way, in that, you know, she's this rough and ready girl from District 12 or whatever, and suddenly they put her in front, of, in front of everyone on TV, so they have to alter reality and make it look as though she's conventionally beautiful. She basically accidentally starts a revolution. Uh, so we have here, I stand there feeling broken and small, thousands of eyes trained on me. There's a long pause. Then, from somewhere in the crowd, someone whistles Rue's four-note Mockingjay tune. The one that signaled the end of the workday in the orchards. The one that meant safety in the arena. By the end of the tune, I have found the whistler, a wizened old man in a faded red shirt and overalls. His eyes meet mine. Yeah, and then that man gets shot in the head because, you know, totalitarian government. But well, that's the whistle that goes like... <laughs> I'm not even going to try and whistle. So we have this big party in the capital as well. And, um, yeah, they have these this drink that basically you can drink this drink and it's going to make you vomit. So that you can fit more food into your stomach. So basically, uh, you know, it's shown as, as this way of how the capital is wasting resources that could have been used to feed the hungry, you know. Uh, so it kind of shows off that, uh, you know, the debauchery and that level of excess. But also, I guess that's basically like societally acceptable be bulimia, isn't it? Katniss tries to give, what's his name, uh, Gale, tries to give him some gloves. And he doesn't, take, he doesn't take them, he says, I don't want anything they're made in the capital. I look down at the gloves. Anything they made in the capital? Was that directed at me? Does he, he, does he think I am now just another product of the capital and therefore something untouchable? The unfairness of it all fills me with rage, but is mixed up with fear over what kind of crazy thing he might do next. This bit kind of annoyed me because basically Haymitch is having a go at this, to be fair, sadistic soldier guy for whipping somebody. But basically Katniss ran in front of him and got hit in the face. And then Haymitch is like, uh, the first call I find out, uh, the first call I make when I get home is to the capital. Find out who authorised you to mess up my Victor's pretty little face. And it's like, well, she ran in front of him as he was swinging a whip through the air. He couldn't have stopped himself. You know what I mean? It's not his fault that he hit her. Sure, it's his fault he's hitting the other guy. But if you run in front of somebody who's swinging a whip through the air and then you get hit in the face, you can't then be like, who authorised you to hit me? It's like stepping out in front of a moving car and then getting hit by the car and being like, you tried to run me over. And it's like, no, you ran in front of a fucking car. I did think this was good though. After that, they're trying to get him, uh, they're trying to get Gail, who's being whipped. They're trying to get him back to, um, to what, what's her name's mother? I've forgotten her name again. It's because it's always first person. Katniss, that's the one. 
So um, it says, there's no stretcher, but the old woman at the clothing stall sells us the board that serves at her countertop. Which I thought was a really a nice touch there, you know? That's what this world is like. You don't get anything for free. Somebody won't even help you for free. And then um, we get this stuff. Uh, what is that stuff, asks Peter. It's from the capital. It's called Morphling, my mother answers. Which is morphine. But I always find it interesting to see morphine in books. Either in fantasy or in um, books aimed at younger readers. Which this arguably is. Like another one would be in The Wizard of Oz. There's all this field of poppies and everyone starts falling asleep. And I'm like, that's, that's morphine. It's just written morphine into this children's story. And morphine is basically heroin. I also thought this little bit was interesting here as well. So there's this thing called Tesserae, which is basically where you put your name in for an extra chance to be picked to fight in the Hunger Games, but in return you get more food. But it doesn't always work out like that, so... As the days pass, things go from bad to worse. The mines stay shut for two weeks, and by that time, half of District 12 is starving. The number of kids signing up for Tesserae soars, but they often don't receive their grain. Food shortages begin, and even those with money come away from stores empty-handed. When the mines reopen, wages are cut, hours extended, miners sent into blatantly dangerous work sites. The eagerly awaited food promised for parcel day arrives spoiled and defiled by rodents. The installations in the square see plenty of action as people are dragged in and punished for offences so long overlooked we've forgotten they're illegal. So we have another reference here to that tagline as well, so it says, uh, I'm called, then Hamish and Peter volunteers. So basically, Katniss and Peter are going back into the arena. One of the announcers actually gets teary because it seems the odds will never be in our favour. We star-crossed lovers of District 12. I thought this is an interesting insight into one of the competitors as well. Effie needn't have worried about us being the last to arrive. Only Brutus and the woman from District 2, Enobaria, are present. Enobaria looks to be about 30 and all I can remember about her is that, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, she killed one tribute by ripping open his throat with her teeth. She became so famous for this act that, after she was a victor, she had her teeth cosmetically altered so that each one ends in a sharp point like a fang and is inlaid with gold. She has no shortage of admirers in the capital. I did think this was kind of annoying. Basically Katniss didn't know what CPR is, which I guess I kind of get, but her mum is a healer. So she says here, um, I'm stunned for a moment by the pain, by trying to regain my wind, as I see Finnick close off Peter's nose again. From where I sit, I pull an arrow, whip the notch into place, and I'm about to let it fly when I'm stopped by the sight of Finnick kissing Peter. And it's so bizarre, even for Finnick, that I stay my hand. No, he's not kissing him. He's got Peter's nose blocked off, but his mouth tilted open, and he's blowing air into his lungs. I can see this. I can actually see Peter's chest rising and falling. Then Finnick unzips the top of Peter's jumpsuit and begins to pump the spot over his heart with the heels of his hands. Now that I've got over my shock, I understand what he's trying to do. Once in a blue moon, I've seen my mother try something similar, but not often. If your heart fails in District 12, it's unlikely your family could get you to your, my mother in time anyway. So her usual patients are burned or wounded or ill. Or starving, of course. But I don't know, I just feel like she probably would have heard of CPR still. Like, you don't have to be a doctor to know what CPR is and to be able to save someone's life with it, you know? This is an interesting insight as well. Um, somebody says to Katniss, you're good with this healing stuff. It's in your blood. No, I say, shaking my head. I got my father's blood. The kind that quickens during a hunt, not an epidemic. I just thought that was really well written, those couple of lines there. And then we have a big twist at the end, which of course I knew was coming because I've seen the movies. But all in and all, I did enjoy this. I felt like a little bit too much was dedicated towards the time before the games because my favourite part's always been when they've been in the arena. And I kind of know from the movie of the next book that no time is going to be spent in the arena, so I'm not particularly keen to get to it. I uh, didn't think this was as good as the first one, but there was still a lot of food for thought. Competently written. I think I said before, and I kind of say here as well, that Suzanne Collins' actual writing isn't necessarily the best in the world, but like neither was J.K. Rowling's, and what both of them have got going for them is that they're really good at this kind of world-building stuff. And again, she does it great here and expands on the backstory in a way that's kind of consistent with the first book and which is setting us up for the third one, so I'll be reading and reviewing that one shortly soon too. But in the meantime, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.